Raise your hand real high and Charlie will get a Bible to you as he traverses the middle aisle. Okay, the title of my message this morning is All Things Made New. All Things Made New. In Revelation chapter 20, we covered a lot of area in that, including the final judgment for all non-believers, but also the reward for those, especially the go through the tribulation and are martyrs for their faith during that time, and how God rewards them with positions of responsibility during Jesus' millennial reign. Millennial meaning the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on earth after the tribulation period. And I say this often, I'm looking forward to the millennium because our earth is going to be restored much like it was before Noah's flood, where there was a temperate climate worldwide. Everything grew bigger and better. Uh, It wasn't too hot. It wasn't too cold. And the desert bloomed. The desert was green. (laughs) And I say this, I'm looking forward to that time. But even greater than that is what we're about to read about this morning. It's wonderful what we're going to read this morning. Let's read the first, uh, I'll do just four verses like I do normally, aloud together. Yeah, that's wonderful. And then I'll, I'll proceed with our teaching this morning. Let's pray. Father, we pray over the study and the reading of your word. So important that we become increasingly students of your word. All scripture is given by your inspiration or is profitable for, for teaching, for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness that the man and woman of God may be thoroughly equipped unto every good work. Thank you for your holy scriptures. May we be devout in our study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Reading verse 1, Revelation chapter 21. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And he and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Same, amen to that. And we all look forward to that. We want to escape the pain of this life, but also I want to be kind of like the the persecuted church that regardless of whether we're delivered from it or not, can we exhibit joy that we belong to Jesus in the middle of that struggle? And all of us here, one way or another, are probably struggling physically. Some of us are recovering from COVID. And so it's a struggle. We, we live in dangerous, trying, uh, troubling, challenging times. Amen. But I want us to take seriously what Revelation chapter 21 says to us. Turn to your left, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, please, as we're going to review uh, verse 1. Now, I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. 2 Peter chapter 3, and uh, I'll just be reading from verse 1. We're going to read the entirety of the chapter. Excuse me, just a minute. You don't have to read with me in this instance. I'll just read the chapter. The title in my Bible says, Mockery in the Last Days. Peter writes, Beloved, I now write to you this second, in this second epistle or letter in, 
both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. He wrote two letters. This is the shorter one of the two. Verse 2, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this, that scoffers will come in the last days uh, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this, Peter speaking, they willfully forget. You might want to circle willfully in your Bible. It's a willing choice to forget and turn away from what God has said. They willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. So God lowered the boom back in those days and starting in Genesis chapter 6 through chapter 8 when he sent the flood. Only eight people survived out of millions of people on the earth that flood judgment. And of course God set the rainbow in the sky, the promise that he never again flood the entire earth as he did then. But fire's coming next time. The next judgment will be one of purging the entire universe, I believe. And that's what we're about to read about here in 2 Peter chapter 3. But the heavens and the earth, verse 7, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Perdition meaning their destruction, not their not their ceasing to exist, but their destruction, uh, they, they, they don't deserve heaven. But beloved, verse 8, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. A lot of people take this scripture and make it applicable to the days of creation, the six days of creation, and I, I don't believe it's applicable. I, I don't believe that's you can transport that over and make it fit over there. Uh, some do, though, but it, it's, it's not, a, not a reference to the creative week. What it is a reference to, God's patience. Amen. God's patience. You know, he allowed them a lot of time before he sent the flood judgment to repent. Uh, you know, in Egypt... Israel was in slavery for 400 plus years and God allowed a lot of time for Pharaoh to repent and he did not and before he executed justice. So it's a, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. That's why it says a day is to a thousand years is a thousand years of today with, with God because he lives out in eternity. There's no time where he is. Time applies only to planet Earth, at least currently. See, so where God lives, there's no time factor. But what this is is a reference to his patience regarding in our time frame that we can identify with. God is, and Why? because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's beautiful. God is very patient. And we can look at our own lives, amen? amen. How many years, for instance, you know, as a prodigal son, I went away from the Lord for all my 20s. And uh, God was so patient with me. And my parents were so patient and never quit praying for me. And they were rewarded with seeing me preach my first sermon in the little church we started on 2nd Street. Uh, by the way, 29 years ago, this coming, thir- uh, th- this coming weekend. Yeah, amen. But the day of the Lord, verse 10, will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Heavy stuff, man.
it's going to be a complete meltdown. You know, we're, we've heard the global warming thing. It's interesting how they've changed the title of that now to climate change. Isn't it interesting? But the true global warming is listed for us here. <laughs> it, it's going to be a true meltdown, man, I'm telling you. Therefore, since all these things will be what? Are you, are you reading along with me? Dissolved. Think about that. The, the building blocks of creation, God started from nothing, by the way. Do you know that? We believe in what's called creation ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. Nothing exists except God and what he wanted to do, and then he created all things from his own creative genius. I lost my thought. Yeah, this, the, the, the dissolution or the dissolving. Uh, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what matter of persons, listen up, Christians, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Sometimes we get apathetic, don't we? We get complacent. We, we, we take God for granted, his grace and his mercy. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, by which, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. The very building blocks, the atoms, protons, neutrons, all that is going to be dissolved. This new creation is brand new stuff, man. It's not a renovation. It's not a restoration. Like I think the millennium is kind of a, res uh, a renovation. But this is brand new stuff. All things become new. And the, the creative word here is bara, which means creation from nothing. So it's a new thing that God is doing here. Never, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. He's going to purge the universe. You know, in Romans chapter 8, it indicates, and I think it does more than indicate, that uh, the, the creation is is decaying all of it the universe out there everything is in the state of decay it's winding down and it's tied listen to me to human sin Amen. to human sin that's how important humans are to god everything else he's created is secondary to us which gives us a lot of responsibility men so the entire created order is in decay and it goes back to human sin. You can read it for yourself, Romans chapter 8. Therefore, verse 14, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. It's a wake, final wake-up call to you and I before he executes his final judgment which is a purging of the universe. Brand new stuff's going to come out. There's not going to be any unrighteousness left in the universe. Just not going to be there. And consider that the long-suffering of the Lord is salvation. Notice long-suffering is mentioned in a couple of verses here that we've been reading. That, that means extreme patience. The long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. As also in his epistles or letters, speaking in them of things in which some things are hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they also do the rest of the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. And a challenge to us, and it's always here before us, and I hope I never let down on this challenge. Therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow, verse 19, 
in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. I'm going back to Revelation chapter 21. About a, and I'm going to cover one more point before we move on and resume next week with this teaching. All things made new. Again, it's not restoration, it's not renovation, it's not a remodeling, it's brand new stuff. Period. In verse 6 of Revelation 21, he said to me, it is done, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. <coughs> Excuse me. And now I'm going to turn <coughs> to John chapter 4, the Gospel of John chapter 4, the fourth of the four Gospels. And in this, uh, Jesus meets a woman at the well in his day, and I'm going to read from verse 1. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than them, than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. The Jewish people, especially the religious Jews, which were very often self-righteous, they despised the Samaritans. They were half-breeds. They were a combination of Jews and Assyrians or whatever, you know, had overcome the land of Judea. And so, especially, women were second-class citizens. If you think there's a struggle for women's rights here, uh, nothing like there was then. Okay. So it blew her away that this Jewish guy would even talk to her, much less have meaningful uh, dialogue with her. Jesus answered, verse 10, and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. I'm not going to go on further in this chapter, but uh, going back to Revelation chapter 1, now again in verse 6, that's where I, I went from there to John, where it says, And he said to me, It is done, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him or thirst. And that's a challenge for us today that we can... Go to Jesus and drink freely of the living water from him. And the living water comes to us through the written scriptures. So may we be t- attentive to that. And may our prayer be that we become more uh, students of your scriptures, whereby we can grow, as Peter says, grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord, Sa- Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Okay, at this time, I'm going to ask that you come forward and pick up a communion cup off the table here. And then I'll go over there in just a few minutes. We'll begin to have communion together.
It's your blood that cleanses me. It's your blood that gives me life. It's your blood that took my place in redeeming sacrifice. Washes me whiter than the snow than the snow my jesus god's precious sacrifice it's the blood of the lamb it's the blood of the it's the blood of the Lamb that can cleanse the deepest stain, washes me whiter than the snow, than the snow, my Jesus. God's precious sacrifice. What is it? Okay. It's your blood that cleanses me. It's your blood that gives me life. It's your blood that took my place in redeeming sacrifice. Washes me whiter than the snow, than the snow. My Jesus, God's precious sacrifice. It's the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb. It's the blood of the Lamb that can cleanse the deepest stain, washes me whiter than the snow. Than the snow, my Jesus, God's precious sacrifice. Amen. Amen. Please turn in your Bibles, if you will, to First Corinthians chapter eleven. First Corinthians New Testament, chapter eleven. I've got a couple of prayer requests uh, before me that I had overlooked when I was up there, and we're going to deal with those right now. Uh, a man named Bill Courtney, who's a friend of Tony Fuller's, has cancer. 
And uh, Linda's not sure what part of the body. So it's, you know, God knows. And then also pray for uh, her son, Kevin. Uh, he needs help with his smoking and, and other things as well. So, Father, we pray for Bill Courtney right now. Lord, you know his physical situation and also his spiritual situation. We pray for Bill. We pray for healing from the cancer and also that uh, you strengthen him in his walk with you. So we lift him up now before you. And, uh, per Linda's request, but he and Tony are friends, and so I know Tony's praying as well. And also for Linda's son, Kevin, and uh, we, we know Kevin has struggled for a long time with stuff. But Father, you're, you're the deliverer. You're the setter free of those that are uh, addicted to drugs, alcohol, whatever. Many of us sitting right here used to be in bondage to that stuff, and we are no longer. We thank you for that. We have been set free by the living word of God. So thank you. We pray for them now in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle Paul, in writing the Corinthian church, he says in verse 23, he says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And I'm going to do it a little bit different. We're going to do that first, and then I'll go uh, to the cup following. So we're going to break the bread, that little wafer. I thank A.D. for opening my, my cup for me. I struggle with that. So now I have it in my hand, this little wafer, and uh, it represents the body of Jesus. And that's what it is. It's an emblem. And so as we take it together, what we're doing, in effect, is we are sharing Jesus with one another. You know, the hollow bread that they use at the Last Supper, it's a loaf they would pass around the table. And each guy would take a piece of that loaf. That loaf was representative of Jesus himself. So they were communing with Jesus by taking the bread. So we can view it for ourselves. It's different, but it's an emblem. So we can make that app. Amen? Father, we thank you for what this represents. The willing Jesus to go to the cross and before going to the cross, take all that punishment, that mockery, being spit in the face, slapped in the face, prophesy who hit you when they covered his head. The crown of thorns pounded into his skull before they ever nailed him to the cross. And the scourging, oh Father, what your son went through for us because he and you, Father, loved us so much. So we thank you for what this represents, the body of the only perfect human that ever lived, Jesus our Lord. In his name we pray and thank you. Amen. Let's take together. Verse 25, 1 Corinthians 11. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And I'm going to stop there, but I, I love that scripture because every time we do this, it's looking forward to that time when Jesus is going to come for us in the rapture, and then later during the millennium, and what we talked about a little bit this morning, the new heavens and the new earth, in which only, check it out, righteousness dwells. There'll be no sin there, period. That's wonderful. Because no sin, there's no death, etc. So let's take the, the grape juice. It's pure. 
you know, from the grape. No contamination. Je Jesus' body didn't even begin to show decay in the grave. So it's his perfect, this is perfect emblem of his perfect blood. Amen? Amen? Father, we thank you for what this represents. The blood of the only one who, who could take all of our punishment on himself so that we could be set free and forgiven. We're so grateful to Jesus for doing that. We have been forgiven of all of our sins. We're so grateful. We know we're going to heaven. We know we're going to be uh, with Jesus for eternity and with you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. We thank you. Amen. Let's drink together.